Thank you for joining us this morning. As we have heard, one of the barriers to advancing watershed work is having the financial resources needed to complete landscape scale projects. Our next two presenters are joining us to tell us about new federal funding opportunities and existing private funds. Senator Michael Bennett has represented Colorado in the United States Senate since 2009. Widely recognized as a pragmatic and independent thinker, he is driven by a deep-seated obligation to create more opportunity for the next generation. Michael has built a reputation of taking on Washington dysfunction and working with Republicans and Democrats to address our nation's greatest challenges. Senator Bennett has been an advocate for increased federal funding for forest management and watershed restoration, having supported the federal infrastructure legislation of 2022. So uh, joining us by Zoom, please help me welcome United States Senator Michael Bennett. Thank you, Christian. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, I've learned to say that over the last two years. Uh, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me to share a few words and for Club 20's uh, tremendously close partnership over the years. When I think about our work together, Club 20 has consistently put forest health and water near the top of the agenda. You guys anticipated Western water and forestry challenges years ago, and sadly, virtually everything you predicted has come to pass. Intense drought that's left Colorado farmers and ranchers with a lot less water, three of the largest wildfires in our state's history and the devastating Marshall Fire, just just this just um, devastating Marshall Fire, literally uh, the day before New Year's this year, all those fires in the last two years, mudslides that blockaded I-70 for weeks and made national news, Lake Powell now at its low, lowest level since the reservoir was filled 60 years ago. We're living through a crisis for Western water, which is why last fall I invited Senator Romney to float the Colorado River with me. We, we did it in mostly in Moab so we could see the water levels firsthand and think about how to deal with these issues in a bipartisan way. Mitt Romney didn't need any persuasion, but back in Washington, I've been making the case for years that in Colorado, watersheds and forests are more important to our economy than the Lincoln Tunnel is uh, to New York City. And after years of what felt like banging my head against the wall, I can actually finally report some progress. We secured $5.5 billion for our forests and the bipartisan infrastructure bill that represents a massive increase in the money available for forestry, including 3.4 billion to reduce wildfire risk with efforts like thinning and harvesting, creating fuel breaks and improving detection and monitoring. We passed my bill to authorize the Joint Chiefs program and double its funding. That program is critical to supporting wildfire mitigation and forest health projects that cross both public and private lands. We secured $8 billion for Western water, as Christian was mentioning, including $300 million for emergency watershed protection. After the Grizzly Street fire, that funding was critical to stabilize the water intake systems in Glenwood Springs, and there's still more that we need to do all across the state. We secured a $50 million to implement the drought contingency plan for the upper basin of the Colorado. And that's just the infrastructure bill. We also just passed a budget that invests in many of the projects people in this room have talked about over the years, including over $6 million to improve municipal water systems in Dove Creek, Craig, Minturn, Rico, and Walden. The, la the latest budget has over $120 million to support 64 projects just like that across Colorado, many of them on the Western Slope. We can talk about those in a minute, but when you add it all up, I'm not sure there's been a time, at least in my, t my lifetime, that Congress has actually done more to put resources on the ground for Western water and Western forests. And of course, that doesn't mean our work is finished we still got communities all across the Western Slope working incredibly hard to support forest health and watershed restoration with severely limited budgets. They're doing the work that the federal government in many cases is supposed to, to have done. And all they want is a little bit of support from Washington, not federal mandates, but real collaboration. And that's why I wrote the Outdoor Restoration Partnership Act, a bill 
with broad support from Club 20 uh, members like <clears throat> Merrick Linky that invest $60 million to support local communities to protect our forests and watersheds. I know $60 billion is a lot of money, but that, that's what we've been spending fighting fires every five years in this country. And there's nothing fiscally conservative about waiting for the fires and spending spending money at $50,000 an acre instead of doing it at $1,400 an acre and creating a bunch of jobs in the Rocky Mountain West at the same time. And so we got a lot of work ahead, but I, I can tell you it's nice for once to, to be able to report some actual progress from Washington on the issues that we've talked about for years. While I have you, I just wanted to mention postal reform, which is something that I've heard from a lot of Club 20 members of the years. As you know, the finances of the post office were a, a total mess and it would threaten essential American services, critical to rural communities especially. And, and I would say these are essential to our rural communities. This bill that we just passed and went to the president's desk will put the Postal Service on a much stronger footing for years to come, and hopefully it's going to result in more investments in service on the West Slope of Colorado. Finally, the last thing I want to mention before I quit is we secured $65 billion for high-speed broadband in the infrastructure law. That's the most significant investment in American history. And the bill was based on the Bridge Act, which I wrote in Colorado with Club 20 and rural co-ops like DMEA. And, and this, what we said, and just to remind you of, of the bill, was we had had enough you know, subsidizing the largest telecom companies in the world and then watching them not build out broadband to rural areas in this country. And, and instead, we, we needed to have states and local communities be able to do that. So the bill essentially says that in the 21st century, we should insist on the same high-speed broadband in every rural community that's available in any city on the coast. Uh, and instead, we should be investing in rural co-ops like DMEA. So, so for once, there's some good news in DC. So let, let me just end with this observation. After years of investing everywhere except in America, you know, we're finally beginning to rebuild our country. We're investing in our future. We're finally making Western water and forests a national priority. And you can draw a straight line from virtually every achievement I've described today and Club 20's advocacy and leadership over the years. So more than anything else this morning, I just wanna say thank you. We've got a lot of work ahead and I, I know we don't agree on everything, but I also know the only way we ever make progress as a country is through uh, the kind of honest conversations that we've had over the years. So thanks again for having me and I'll turn it back over to Krishna. Happy to take anybody's questions or criticisms. Thank you, Senator. We appreciate you joining us this morning. Are there questions for Senator Bennett related to um, the topic we're here today for, which is forest and watershed health? Um, who's running the microphone this morning? Ray Beck, I think I saw you volunteer. Thank you, sir, for your volunteerism. See how that's done. Okay, who, did I see a hand up here? All right. Let's start and again, as a reminder, please introduce yourself so that our speakers know who and where you're from. <clears throat> Senator Bennett, Steve Hansen, CEO with Nyman. Enterprises here in Colorado, we have a mill in Montrose. First thing I'd like to do is thank you for your commitment and your leadership to get the funding that is so critical and crucial to the watersheds. And the question I have is having met personally with a regional forester here with the Forest Service yesterday in the state forester in Colorado, there appears to be a real strong partnership and dedication by two very strong individuals to be active and to take your agenda forward. And we as partners want to support them. The question is, I hear from the chief of the Forest Service, the assistant chief, that this is a good down payment. And this is a great start. And I believe sincerely that the chief of the Forest Service wants to create fire resilient forest and he wants to do the right thing. The issue is after so long, what can we look like for sustainability once the Forest Service ramps up, once the partners come together? Yeah. Yeah. Once we really lean into this, 
Are you going to be able to get your colleagues and others to sustain this effort so we truly can make a difference three, five, 10, 15 right. years out? Thank right. you. Right. I, I think Thank that's such a, great, such a great point. And I, and I do think that that bill that I mentioned earlier, the Outdoor Restoration Partnership Act, which basically was written on the West Slope of Colorado, is the answer to that. I mean, you know, that that bill, uh, as I said, calls for sixty billion dollars of spending over ten years to deal with this. The five billion we have, I agree with that. I think it, I, I would agree that with the assessment of the the chief that it's a good down payment, and I'm just going to have to go back and and find some vehicle to to get this bill passed. There was in the reconciliation bill that did not pass, there was $27 billion uh, to fund uh, the, the Outdoor Restoration Act, which would have carried us you know, far into the future. It wasn't the full 60 billion, but it was, it was half of that. That would have been the most significant investment in our forests in the country's history. I also had an additional 27 billion for conservation for, for soil health that would have been the biggest investment that we had made since the Dust Bowl. And both of those are important priorities for me, and we're going to continue to push. You, you asked, how do we convince my colleagues? You know, this, this, uh, uh, this has been a, a, a process of, of taking back what the effects are in real time to our economy, to our way of life, of the of the of the drought that we're experiencing and and i'm sorry sorry to say this but matters are only going to get worse in that respect and club 20 knows that we have to prepare for the future and as mitt romney said when he and i went uh together on you know on on the raft you know he said i don't want washington telling us what to do but washington should be helping fund some of the stuff that we have to do to, to make this transition. And part of that is our, our forests. And that's, that's work we're going to be advocating for over many years to come. This was the first year when we had all that smoke last year in Colorado from California. It actually finally this year managed to make it to the East Coast. And that's the reason why I think we've been able to make the progress that we've been able to make this year. Thank you, Senator. But well, I guess the last last point is your point is so important for businesses like yours and for other folks around the country. The predictability that's required is really, really important. That's why we have to do this over the long haul, not just the short term. Thank you, Senator. Is there another question for Senator Bennett? Cindy Dozier in the back of the room has a question and Ray, if you'll get the microphone over. I to want you. to just show Ray that I uh, have today. I'm representing today because I have my Moffat hey. County water bottle. <laughs> thank you, Senator. You, the, thank you. It's the best thing anybody ever gave me. <laughs> uh, good morning, Senator. Thank you so much for being with us. Cindy Dozier with Club 20, Colorado Forest Water Alliance, and Rocky Mountain Reg Rest restoration initiative, blah, blah. Um, how do you see protection of water being incorporated into forestry legislation and land management decisions? This whole conference that we've been uh, here discussing for the last, uh, gosh, 48 hours or so, um, has been with regards to connecting our forests and our waters from the headwaters to the use and how do we incorporate that into pending legislation and utilizing this funding in a really effective manner i mean i let me just say, I, I completely agree though if this water if if this if at the heart of all this you know if water weren't at the heart of all this there'd be no that we wouldn't be able to make the arguments that we're making but the argument that i'm making is these forests as i said our infrastructure that's important as any infrastructure in America. And I, I literally believe that every single thing that's downstream from this water, which is every farm and ranch in Colorado, it's every business in Colorado, it's our large cities and the smallest communities, we're all downstream from that water and therefore we're all downstream from those forests. And if those forests are unhealthy, and if those forests burn and 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 clog up or or destroy our watersheds, which could happen, it's going to transform Colorado for 
for generations. And that's why when I say it's more important than Lincoln Tunnel, when I tell Schumer that, I mean it because you can at least get into Manhattan on the GW Bridge if the Lincoln Tunnel is closed. We don't have that with respect to our forests. And, and, and it's also not something that's just about mountaintops either. You know, I've stood in places like Durango and looked over the, 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 the town with, with people that are trying to plan how to thin the forest around the community and had conversations with them where we've said, you know, this is, we need to think about this. There's no more important infrastructure we have because it's protecting, in this case, the chance of there being catastrophic loss of property or loss of life. And that's why we need to do our work. So all this stuff is connected. And I am, I will say, in terms of water, if you look at there's going to be $688 million in, in water infrastructure funds that are coming to Colorado State Revolving Fund, including clean drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater projects. There's going to be overall, you know, for the West, a, about $8 billion in Western water resiliency, including a, a very substantial amount for tribal water projects. Uh, to create clean drinking water and sanitation projects. And at the same time, and that was, by the way, a bill that I wrote with, with Senator Hickenlooper and Senator Heinrich from New Mexico. Uh, then we've got uh, forestry and fire mitigation. So we've got, as I mentioned, 300 million for emergency watershed protection and 225 million to carry out burn area rehabilitation on National Forest Service land. And, and that none of that is enough but it's a it's certainly better than we were uh, just a couple of years ago and as i mentioned you know we the, we there was a mention made of the good collaboration between the state forestry program and the and the and the federal folks we need everybody working together fire doesn't know any political boundaries or any political jurisdictions and th and that's why senator hoven who's a republican from north dakota and i put in that bill on joint chiefs because that's a way of getting the agencies to, act, to actually work in a collaborative way. We've got to work. We got to do this at the landscape level. And in the end, it, none of it matters if if we're, what we're not if we're, if we're not protecting our water. That's the whole point of what we're trying to do. Thank you. And I do want to just say thank you also for your earlier remark of working with Club 20 on these matters. We have a room full of subject matter experts here today, and we look forward to working with you. Well, and if stuff, um, and, and you, I think you guys know this, but if stuff is as, as decisions start to get made and things start to get implemented and, and things begin, you know, if there, there are things that aren't making sense, let me know, please. Uh, Rachel Richards, uh, Pickin County in Aspen. Thank you, Senator Bennett, for your time with us today. Um, my question is, how is the coalition building going with other people who have a great interest in this, such as the California senators, and Arizona senators, all the utilities that buy the, water, the energy from Lake Powell? It would seem that if we can really get Imperial Valley <laughs> behind us, uh, to save our forest, uh, we, we might have a little more clout both in the House and the Senate. Thank you. We're, you know, it, 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 Rachel, it's just beginning. Uh, when I, I mentioned, I didn't, I'm not sure I mentioned that when I went to, um, when I went to Utah, I took 15 people from Colorado, many of them water people, and uh, the same from from Utah. A lot of people knew each other already, and those relationships are going to be really important as we get into this co coalition building and conversation. And uh, and just the other day, Hickenlooper and I had a conversation with Mark Kelly, who's from Arizona, and John has been trying to put together the Western senators, Republicans and Democrats to come together for our first meeting on water. And obviously there are tensions that exist and there are interests that exist between the upper basin and the lower basin. And everybody's, rightly so, everybody's keeping their eye on their interests and their state's interests and, 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 and the interests of their basin. But I think we are realizing that we are on the cusp of some really seismic um, changes and interruptions on the Colorado River, and it's going to require us to have, uh, I think, a regional approach in the West that that leads Washington rather than waiting for Washington to lead us, which I think would be a big mistake. 
is if we do that, we won't end up solving the problem and we will end up, you know, driving the West into the ditch. So um, I would say early days and any help you can give us to push people in the direction of a, a collaborative spirit on this stuff, we would appreciate very much. I don't just mean you, Rachel, I mean you, Club 20. And Senator, we are out of time, but I just want to thank you again for joining us this morning. We really appreciate your partnership and collaboration and look forward to seeing you in person at some point soon. I can't wait to see you guys in person. I'm so sorry I'm not there today and have, have a wonderful rest of the meeting and a great weekend. And don't, and don't to forget too. to pay your membership due, Senator. We're looking forward I'll get, to it. I'll get, I, will, I will get on that this afternoon. Sorry about that. <laughs> thank you, sorry about that. Let me tell you something. I hope it doesn't take me two and a half hours to get my dues paid, which is what it took me <laughs> with these direct TV guys earlier this week <laughs> to get my stuff turned on because my credit card got stolen. But well, that's a whole- We'll make sure there's no lap in your membership. Senator. All right, good. Thank you. Talk to you. See <laughs> ya. You. Bye. Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So joining Senator Bennett to talk about funding opportunities is Sarah Hoversten, the Director of Business for Water Stewardship, which is a network of businesses focused on securing water for business, nature, and communities. Sarah cultivates, main, maintains, and expands partnerships that help advocate or advance impact um, and impact the parent organization of Bonneville Environmental Fund. Um, whose mission is to envision a thriving world where everyone has access to clean water and renewable energy. So Sarah is joining us here by Zoom today. So let's give Sarah a warm welcome. Great, thanks Richard. I just wanna make sure, cause I can only see from here. Can everybody see my, just my slides? Yes, they look perfect. Awesome, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I thank you for having me um, it's a you know tough act to follow following Senator Bennett, but um, a little bit of a switch to here to a basement in Portland, Oregon. But I'm really pleased to be here today. Uh, so I'm Sarah Hoverson. I'm the director of Business for Water Stewardship Program at Bonneville Environmental Foundation, and BEF has worked for decades at the intersection of watershed restoration and renewable energy. And our BWS program, as we call it, represents really all the work that we do around what we would call environmental water stewardship. Um, and I think if you all were, were here yesterday to hear John Radke with Coca-Cola and Mike Bernier with Swire Coca-Cola, they teed this all up very nicely as we are one of the, um, the activation partners that I would say that help bring the stewardship programs and objectives and um, goals to life with the corporate partners on the project side. So BEF's work um, in this area was initiated about 15 years ago, really trying to create a, a market or a program through which companies could invest in projects and products that would deliver water stewardship outcomes. And it was built on this foundation of that concept of balancing the water footprint. So how do we work with companies to understand uh, their water use and um, restore to nature what they were consuming it is a way to balance that concept. And <clears throat> over the years, though, our work has really evolved significantly, especially over the past decade. And it really reflects the arc and the status of the corporate environmental watership uh, stewardship movement. Today, we provide really deep expertise across a lot of different geographies across um, the US and North America, and increasingly internationally. Um, we provide strategic vision for these water stewardship programs, goals, and the way they get implemented from the project side. Uh, we provide connections to on the ground partners and pathways to support innovative solutions for our complex water challenges. Um, and the simplest way to think about it, we're really the middle person who's acting, um, translating between the uh, NGO or agency partners on the ground and the corporate partners, and then ultimately funding um, the, the project partners on the ground. Over the years, we have helped uh, to facilitate funding for nearly 150 water stewardship projects across 26 U.S. states, 
Um, and like I said, increasingly internationally, we have large partnerships in both Canada and Mexico, and then um, growing also in Europe. Uh, those projects restored around 30 billion gallons of fresh water to ecosystems in need. And that's been through partnerships with about 60 corporate partnership partners or so, and finally millions of, of dollars to uh, these projects. So with water stress growing very visibly across the US and the world, Corporations are increasingly making this connection between the water stress and their op operational, um, or even as John mentioned yesterday, their reputational risk. Uh, and increasingly, they're developing uh, and participating in water stewardship actions, investments, or strategies that occur outside of their direct operational footprint, or as we would refer to it, um, outside of the fence line. And they're making these public commitments with measurable goals and, and objectives. Uh, I'm providing here just a few examples to show you what, what these companies are, are committing to very much in the public sphere. And you did hear directly from really the first mover in this space and the continuous beacon, I think, in this movement, Coca-Cola today. I think this is their updated 2030, part of their updated 2030 uh, water stewardship goal and strategy. Um, and with these strategies and these public commitments, uh, we've led to increased budgets and uh, greater opportunities to support water projects across the country. Now, what, what we originally thought would be this very transactional market of you know, balancing the water footprint, this drop for drop consideration, um, is, you know, we fund a project, it delivers X volume, and they purchase the volume to balance it very much like the carbon offsets market or the renewable energy certificates um, market hasn't really gone that way. And kind of like water itself, you know, it's, it's paved its own course you have there. We have realized, um, it's, actually we knew, but but what has come to life more and more that the water is just so local and the solutions are so place dependent that the movement has really had to adapt <clears throat> to expand its thinking on how we would be able to fund these projects and, and what it means for corporate claims um, and what corporations are putting out there. And uh, John, sorry, har targeting uh, John a lot. I wonder if he's in the room today. Um, but he mentioned this yesterday too, of, of moving away from this concept of chasing the drops, of trying to find where we can get the highest volume projects at the lowest cost to, um, to really expanding the thought of the kind of impact that we're looking to drive with these projects and the, the kind of long-term nature of partnerships that is required in these spaces. So today we are seeing, and we are actually trying to drive very much this transition away from these transactional uh, projects being funded to more transformational actions that are really helping to catalyze these large scale water impacts that we need. Um, <clears throat> So when the companies kind of, you know, come to us or we partner with these organizations, what they're looking at now as far as drivers for projects that they would be interested in funding are those that support, support this transformative, excuse me, transformative change and they catalyze progress with our shared water challenges. <clears throat> Each company has a different um, interest area given their operational footprint or where their stakeholders are or where their large customer base is. Um, but there's definitely a lot of overlap in some of those areas, uh, like the Colorado River Basin that serves so many of the, from the lower basin states and into California. Um, they want to see projects that really offer a clear pathway to be able to fund them, that the projects get implemented, they deliver reportable long-term water benefits and climate resilience. We want to see projects now, now more that drive this breadth of co-benefits, um, serving not only the environmental uh, impact side, but also the social and economic needs of the communities. Uh, they want to be able to leverage their corporate funding with public and other private sources to kind of make that funding go further and make these projects uh, move into implementation if we can. Uh, and we want to demonstrate scalable, collective, and innovative funding models to address identified priorities spaces. Um, so, you know, private funding is, that is available isn't going to solve the problem. We're starting how many is coming from the public space and it's only a drop in the bucket is needed. 
but and and the scale of private funding in the space from corporations um, is definitely a lot smaller than the public space. Um, but it does prove to be very, very flexible. And it's a crucial leverage for other funding sources, projects like these public funding that Senator Bennett was just speaking to. Uh, and I think it's also a really, you know, big deal, actually, just to say it uh, very plainly, as was highlighted with the Windy Gap project that was mentioned yesterday, you have to have these really recognizable brands that are understanding and supporting these projects has benefits to think far beyond just the, the funding amount themselves or itself. So I did want to um, highlight very, very briefly uh, a couple projects that we have funded um, more of these kind of what we would say is collective action where we have a number of uh, corporate partners that are funding or contributing funding to these projects. Just to give you a sense of um, what we're seeing the partners invest in and, and why. <clears throat> and we have a, a variety of project types that we, we fund um, from these kind of leasing or flow transaction projects, uh, which were really a um, a foundation of the program, again, because they have that quantifiable volume associated with them that's easy to identify and then for companies to claim off of. Um, but we also fund a lot of nature-based solutions and projects and increasingly more um, <clears throat> projects with tribal nations and projects, uh, wash projects that are those water access, sanitation, and health projects. So the first one to speak to uh, very briefly is close to home for you all. It's the uh, 15 mile reach restoration project with the Colorado Water Trust. This project was securing water um, to deliver to the Grand Valley Power plant to produce hydropower. Once that water has been cycled through, then it is uh, released back to the 15 mile reach, a critical stretch of the Colorado River during crucial times to support endangered fish species. Um, we've worked multiple years and across multiple projects with the Colorado Water Trust. That a lot of our partners have, have supported and um, this project in particular, we have funded multiple rounds of the years of, um, and as you can see, it's gotten support from groups like Coca-Cola and Intel to Major League Baseball and the Colorado Rockies um, and a few other of our partners here. Uh, this project is very uh, attractive as it has those long-term flow benefits. Um, there's a collaborative nature of it, of the organizations and entities that are, are working on the project. And then there's additional co-benefits like expanding carbon-free hydroelectric power production. <clears throat> um, this next project is the Colorado River Indian System Conservation Project. This is really a marquee uh, project in our space, something everyone is, is very, very proud of and a real gold star, I think, in the movement. Um, driven by that drought contingency plan that Senator Bennett mentioned, this project compensates the the CRIT, the Colorado River Indian Tribes, for conserving up to 150,000 acre feet of its Colorado River water for a multi-year period to really achieve decade scale supply, supply benefits for the Colorado River, Lake Mead, and the lower basin states. Um, this was in partnership with the, with the state, with the Arizona Department of Water Resources, with Bureau of Reclamation, and then obviously the, the tribes, tribal nation. Um, this project not only provides water resilience for the lower basin states, it also helps to monetize the water rights that we know tribal nations have uh, been hard fought and not always having the, the full benefit of those. Um, it supports the long-term priorities of the grid to even modernize their irrigation on reservations and conserve additional water. <clears throat> and with 15 private corporate funders that um, it will bring to the table, Adding to the large amount of public funding for this project, it's really one of the largest multi-sector sector collaborative uh, efforts that we've ever achieved in this space. Um, and even greater is the this partnership and the funding through this way was able to launch uh, further project opportunities with the CRIT. We are looking at, at funding with um, many partners that are up on the screen right now um, to on-reservation projects that are irrigation modernization and efficiency projects to continue to reduce the pull off the river um, and support the, the objectives of the tribal nations. Um, and the last project, just for a quick highlight, which might be a little bit closer to, uh, to home today, given that it's a forest and water watershed health project, 
um, in the nature-based solution category for us, which, like we said, is increasingly, um, as we look think about transformational projects, these are the types of projects that uh, our corporate partners and us are seeking more and more. Um, this is in Tahoe National Forest project uh, treats and protects 48,000 acres of forest in critical water source areas. Um, this increases the downstream water supply in, and mitigating the risk of catastrophic fire and the environmental impacts and social impacts associated with that has been a real driver from partners in this world. Um, and this project in particular, in partnership with Blue Forest, applies an innovative financing strategy to try to scale impact further and further um, beyond uh, just the source waters in California. Um, we are also funding uh, forest resilience projects uh, on behalf of corporate partners uh, in New Mexico and in South Carolina and in other places as well. Um, and so just to kind of wrap up in, in the thoughts around this is we're, we're seeing more and more companies come to this space, this environmental water stewardship space, um, and have a desire to fund these bigger, what we would could argue is more impactful projects um, and bringing this flexible funding to the table. You know, the main issue that we're facing and, and continue to face is that what we'd say is the supply, the project supply doesn't always meet um, and match with the project demand. <clears throat> um, corporate funding has a specific timeline and um, objectives and drivers, and we haven't found that there's really a pipeline yet of investment ready projects that can align with those um, quick kind of quick timelines and um, various objectives that corporate partners have. So we're hoping to kind of see a, a shift in that space. You know, how can we support organizations to, to help bring projects that are investment ready to their partners, maybe speed up the timelines where we can in those? Um, and are you really, you know, helping to shift and, and push on the demand side too, on the corporate side of trying to um, build a little bit more patience into the funding and consider long-term partnerships and the impact of a funding that is going to um, help develop projects or um, implement a longer term project timeline that then is one that is absolutely shovel ready and benefits start accruing tomorrow when they invest in it. Um, so with that, you know, we're, we're very excited about what we're seeing in the industry and looking forward to leveraging more and more corporate funding in this space and um, hopefully can match up with a number of you in the room who are bringing some of these innovative project opportunities um, to this area and, and see where we can align on um, continuing to move this movement forward. Thank you so much, Sarah. I actually have a question for you. Are you seeing any of these partners that you're currently working with utilizing corporate funds to leverage fed federal funds for these projects? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, it, and it's kind of chicken or egg, right? Because a number of these projects that move forward that have federal grants have private funding match requirements or some kind of um, leverage requirements, this could be a, a really good spot for the, the corporate funding space to be able to provide those grant matches. Um, and then in, in areas where, where it is of interest to maybe unlock some funding sources, um, we all are seeing a number of our partners who are more willing to um, sign letters of support or, or you know, leverage their brand and their voice a little bit more to um, to bring projects forward or get kind of projects moving off the ground on it. Uh, so, and yes, and I, and I will say too that the corporate, because the corporate funding individually isn't always large enough to move a project forward, they're going to be coming in um, at the top to kind of, to close any funding gaps that may exist with projects. Excellent, thank you. Are there questions in the room for Sarah? We have one here. Again, please introduce yourself. Hi, Sarah. Uh, my name is Jamie Gomez. I'm the executive director with the West Region Wildfire Council. We're a local nonprofit working on um, wildfire issues and as it relates to water as well. And um, I guess maybe it, it's two questions here. Um, one, just really real quick, when, when you're talking about you, there's kind of a misalignment maybe between 
say on the ground project partners and their ability to do this work effectively in terms of the timeline and the, the timelines that some of the corporate partners that you're talking about want to see. They want to see things happen quicker. How quick is quick? Uh, what, what, uh, what kind of timelines say is target or whomever else is up there on that, um, on your slide, um, what, what kind of timelines are they wanting to see? Okay, that was question one. Do you want question two also? Sure. Um, I guess related to that, um, with that Yuba 2 project um, with the Blue Forest, uh, um, I guess, you know, there, when you're talking about some of these projects that are um, directly related to like in-stream flows and water infrastructure and those kinds of things, the connection with uh, improvements to quantifiable volume seems fairly straightforward and measurable, but when you're talking about large scale upland forest management, the ability to quantify volumes on that seems a little trickier. And I'm just curious kind of what the, what process you all are doing out there to actually demonstrate quantifiable volume increases. Yeah, so great on, on both those questions. Um, the, the the timelines are dependent um, based on the company. A lot of times, and, and many of these companies do not have established um, <clears throat> programs with a history quite like John Ratke has established year over year at Coca Cola. But a lot of times, the the organizations are operating on <clears throat> annual budgets and um, annual needs. So. Let's say with a company, we get we get a call and we say we want to we want to source projects in these three. Uh, we've identified these are as um, top priority regions given their water risk and our connection to the area. Um, we'd like to find projects in this space and fund them by the end of the year. And so then at that point, you know, we're going out. We're calling the the networks that we have. Um, we know of a lot of the projects and partners that are happening, but you know, still require scoping getting up to speed on what the projects are today, what the funding gaps are, what the benefits are and the opportunities. Um, in some cases, the, the companies are looking to put money into the projects within like six month time frame. And then the real kicker is that um, these volumetric benefits or even project implement, implementation into benefits, they're looking for that to happen within one you know, to two years of the funding. So, when I say quick, um, sometimes it's like, hey, what projects are just about ready to be implemented and are shovel ready and we could close the funding gap on and then those projects are, are going to get implemented and the benefits are going to start accruing within one year to 18 months. Um, so that's fast, as I understand, with, with a number of these projects, especially those that you know, are still being kicked around or require still engineering or permitting or others to happen. Uh, so that, that alignment is challenging because it just narrows the field of project opportunities quicker or down more quickly, right? When it says, hey, we have this funding level, we have this location, we have this timeline, um, and we want to you know, see benefits happening right away. Um, that is changing a little bit. A lot of the partners have implemented you know, 2020, 30 or out goals in it, where we're trying to help them all build these portfolios of projects that are going to be delivering benefits year over year for 10, 15 year time. And with that then is the ability to think about projects on more of the out year basis. And what we're hoping to push and what we're seeing with the industry move forward to is being a little bit more flexible in that timeline and that opportunity to say, hey, can we invest in some projects now that are going to take a little bit longer to, uh, you know, be designed, finalized, and implemented because they're really impactful and we want them in the portfolio. Um, what we would do then is take this kind of portfolio approach with a company that says, okay, we want to have a couple of these uh, forest resilience projects in that maybe the, the benefits are harder um, to, to quantify or they're longer term, but they're very important. So can we put some chunks of money to those and then at the same time match them up with um, some of these leasing projects or these flow transaction or flow restoration projects that deliver some of the benefits um, in a nearer term 
while allowing for our investment in these other kinds of projects. So that's a long, a long way to answer that the timelines can be very quick on the corporate budget side and their need to find and fund a project. And we're also working with companies to try to elongate that a little bit um, as we move into funding projects in this space that is different than what you know, started with um, in the industry. Um, and then, then, then to the, the question about the, the uh, quantifying of the benefits. Um, <clears throat> John mentioned this also yesterday, that there's this uh, volumetric benefit accounting that has been kind of, of established by the industry. Again, all of this is voluntary, right? These aren't um, uh, regulatory in any way for this restoration. Uh, but that was established with a number of partners, including um, hydrologists and engineering partners to be able to try to quantify the benefits of a variety of different projects. And there's a number of groups in, this, in the space, including a um, group called Limnotech that does a lot of that work to look at the projects, all the details, and to say, hey, this is, this is what um, we could see would be the volume benefit year over year of this project that could be claimable uh, by an organization. Um, Each one of them can kind of be, I think, looked at different at, at times. And part of that ends up coming down to what are the drivers and objectives of the companies? And as um, was mentioned yesterday as well, is you know, we're moving a little bit away from uh, only volumetric drivers. So how are we looking at the uh, comprehensive nature of these projects and the co-benefits that aren't making it, you know, what is the cost per volume restored is the only assessment that's being used with them. And so thinking about the, the value of um, um, the kinds of projects that you were speaking to may not need to go through the, the rigorous assessment or have a really high volume that is able to be quantified to be eligible for um, or interesting to these project funders as they kind of expand their mindset of their funding supporting watershed health um, and not just, you know, balancing their, their water footprint. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us this morning to talk about private yeah. funding opportunities. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Appreciate being here. And thank you for allowing me to be here virtually.